Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients titled Emerging Therapies, COVID Prevention, and the Immunosuppressed, News You Can Use. My name is Erin Kale, and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics, and Advocacy. I oversee our patient research and education activities, as well as our grassroots engagement activities that fall under our Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy, including our ambassador initiative, which comprises highly motivated and engaged patients, caregivers, and living kidney donors around the country and the globe. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives. And we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies such as the coronavirus pandemic. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic, and private sector research shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. And we encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities. At this time, I'd like to introduce Diana Kleins, AAKP's <laughs> Executive Director. Diana has been with the organization for over 17 years, and we're so happy to have her on today's webinar. Diana? Thank you, Erin. First, I'd like to thank everyone who's watching us today and encourage you to join AAKP as a member if you have not already done so. AAKP is the largest independent kidney patient organization in the U.S., founded in 1969. As a kidney patient, family member, or living kidney donor, you can join AAKP free and receive updates from AAKP when your voice is needed to inform innovation, policy, and impact patient care. AKP has hosted an extensive series of webinars since the onset of COVID-19, providing the latest updates from medical experts treating hospitalized patients on the front lines of the pandemic. We have also featured a number of policy and medical experts, federal agency partners, including those from the Veterans Administration and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as patients and caregivers who have been impacted by COVID. As recent research from the University of Michigan and other top research centers have demonstrated, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact upon America's kidney patients. The high infection and mortality rates among both dialysis patients and kidney transplant recipients has been alarming and quite sobering. At AKP, this crisis has renewed our sense of urgency to fight even harder for better prevention and treatments for immunosuppressed and immunocompromised patients. And just as importantly, it has led us to invest even more research, resources in our efforts to fight for policies in Washington, D.C. that will allow patient consumers greater choice in their treatments. This includes making permanent the telemedicine flexibilities patients have been able to use since the start of the pandemic and far greater access to home dialysis treatments. AKP is 100% invested in transcending status quo dialysis care in America. And to us, that means greater choice for patients to do the care in the safety of their own home. Today's webinar supports our educational goals. I would like to thank Dr. Shanka from George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, who was once again sharing her time and expertise with us. George Washington University has been a highly valued partner of AAKPs for many years. Today, with the strong, or excuse me, to go, together with the strong support of GW and under the leadership of our generous friend, Dr. Dominic Raj, we have jointly hosted the annual Global Summit on Kidney Innovations, which will take place virtually this May. Last year, this summit reached patients and researchers in over 80 countries, an amazing testament to the worldwide interest in fighting kidney diseases and the need to develop new solutions to help patients survive and live their lives to the fullest. 
You can also view Global Summit sessions from previous years on demand, and the link to those presentations will be provided later on today. Today's webinar will provide important updates on the impacts of COVID-19 and variants like Omicron ha have on the kidney patient population. Our speaker will also share information about the use of masks and other safety measures you should take. I'd now like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Paul Conway, AKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs. Paul is a kidney patient of over 41 years, receiving a transplant 25 years ago. Paul will discuss some of the data we collected during a recent AAKP flash survey through our Center for Patient Research and Education. Paul, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Diana, and thank you, Aaron, for uh, putting this together, and Dr. Shanka and Dr. Dominic Raj, thank you for your ongoing partnership. So this is the fun part of our webinars. What we actually get to do is take a look at the data that you, our fellow patients out there, have presented to AAKP that forms the backdrop and the basis of today's educational effort. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first slide. Uh, right here, what we did is we went out and we asked folks how they're doing on their vaccinations. And the very nice thing that you'll see here is close to 65% of patients have uh, received their third dose and already 22% have gotten their fourth dose. What this indicates to us is there's a very high understanding of the risk and ongoing risks posed by COVID and its variants and the sense of responsibility that patients have to step up and take care of themselves and protect themselves and all of the medical professionals that have invested their time in us. Now on this slide, we have information that patients gave us about their awareness of monoclonal antibody treatment availability. And on here, you see that the numbers are quite high. People have been reading their information out there on the media uh, and talking to their doctors, and you have fully 86% of the patient population is aware of monoclonal antibodies are available should they become infected. 14% are not aware of it, and that's also a group that we're seeking to educate to make them aware of what their treatment options are in case they are infected. And then in this slide, uh, what we asked is if folks feel safer uh, having those treatments available to them, especially in immunocompromised patients. And as you can see, 60% say yes, but the folks that we're focused on today really are the 28% who say, hey, we may be aware that these treatments are out there, but we don't know what they mean to us. That's a very important number to get educated so that they better understand what's available to them in case they are infected and how it actually works. And that's what Dr. Shankel will get into partly today. And then we asked folks what their level of awareness was about the new therapeutics that are out there that are designed for prevention. And this is where it actually gets interesting for us on the education side. 45% indicated that they were aware of them, 40% are not aware. And this is very important for people to understand the innovation that's taken place over the past 24 months and how there are uh, now treatments that are available for folks as a preventative. And so we wanted to get a better understanding that if people had an opportunity uh, to take advantage of a therapeutic that had been authorized for FDA for the prevention, how many would consider uh, doing so after speaking to their medical professional? Nearly 75% said that they would uh, consider doing that if it was authorized by the FDA and if they spoke to their medical professional. Again, this is a great sign of how where we are as a patient community of our risks and uh, what it takes to have a therapeutic uh, for us to consider. FDA authorization and the advice of a medical professional. We're also interested in that 20% that still need more information. So then we asked for a level of awareness on actions taken by the Department of Health and Human Services on our behalf in making available uh, the therapeutic uh, that is a preventative, and that's called EvuShield. And right here you see about 38% uh, are aware of it, 53% are not. And that's what we'll get into in great detail today. Uh, of those who are aware of EvuShield, we asked them whether or not that made them feel safer, that there is a preventative out there. And just about half the folks said yes, but as you can see, 38% of the people wanna know more, and that's a good thing. We should be asking a lot of questions and getting experts like Dr. Shanker to talk to us. And then just as kind of a stage setter, uh, we wanted to know this, which is as infections and in, uh, hospitalizations continue and as Omicron is out there and now BA2, where do folks feel their confidence is in terms of ongoing uh, safety and vulnerability, and who are the folks that would most respect our concerns. 
And this is interesting uh, to us because you can see we have great faith in our uh, family and friends. Uh, we have great faith in the medical community and in the public health community. They rate the highest in terms of who we think would be uh, respectful of our concerns and our medical conditions. Rating at the lowest, you will see our elected officials and the media. That means we have a lot of folks to hold accountable and to communicate our issues and our concerns on an ongoing basis. And then we asked in terms of uh, responsibility for uh, protecting us on ongoing vulnerabilities, who do you think the best advocate is uh, for your concerns as an immunosuppressed or immunocompromised patient? And overwhelmingly, 69% uh, said we are our own best advocates. Now as patients, we know this, but we also need our allies. And here again, you'll see in a tight grouping that coming after ourselves uh, come family, medical professionals, the public health community. But again, arming ourselves with the knowledge is what will keep us safe. We also asked this in terms of getting an assessment of how far infections have gone. If um, an individual or a member of the family has become infected with the COVID virus, nearly 70% of those who are around us as patients who responded to this survey indicated that somebody had actually been infected. And then we asked in terms of uh, infections for individuals or for family members, how many actually ended up being hospitalized? 21%. Our empathy and concern remains with those people, of course. Uh, but the good news on this is nearly 80% did not require hospitalization. Again, this is a tribute to frontline medical professionals and the innovations that have come into the marketplace to help uh, prevent and treat uh, COVID infections. And we asked the patient community, what are the things that we are doing out there uh, to prevent infection? And now there's a lot of talk across the nation that we're moving beyond COVID. But for those who are immunocompromised and those who are immunosuppressed, there's not much moving on. COVID is still a threat. And so what are we doing as a community and as individuals to remain vigilant and personally responsible? And you can see here, the numbers are absolutely fantastic. We're doing our vaccinations. We're continuing to use masks. Uh, we're doing hand washing. We're doing social distancing. It's not easy. It's difficult. But the most positive thing about this slide is that individuals understand their risk. And we understand our sense of responsibility, especially transplant patients, to honor our gift of life and to stay in good health in the midst of COVID. So as we take a look at this data and we get ready for our presentation today, again, we encourage you to join the American Association of Kidney Patients, take an active role in your health, uh, participate in our surveys, and most importantly, impact policy and medical practice. Because as patients, we are partners with our doctors and we are leaders on national policy. We'd be happy to have you join us. Thank you very much. Toss it back over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Paul and Diana. And thank you to those of you listening today who shared your responses to our flash survey. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Divya Shanka. Dr. Shanka is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Kidney Diseases and Hypertension at the George Washington University. She is board certified in internal medicine and completed her nephrology and transplantation medicine training from Whale Cornell. Her clinical interests include precision medicine for genetic cause of kidney disease, immunosuppression for transplantation, management of rejection in transplant patients, and COVID-related kidney disease. Dr. Shanka has several publications in high-impact journals in topics ranging from urinary cell trans transcriptomics in acute rejection to dialysis in COVID-19 patients. Dr. Shanka has presented on several AAKP webinars, including on topics such as advancements for highly sensitized patients, and on the monoclonal antibody treatment. We greatly appreciate her time and we are so pleased to have her presenting once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanka. I turn things over to you. Thank you, Erin, and thank you, AKP, for once again giving me this opportunity. Um, I always find this opportunity to interact with our patient community as the best tool in making a change uh, in their lives. So always happy to be a part of uh, AKP. So without any further ado, we can get started. Today's talk, uh, I'm gonna try focus on what are the available treatments, what are the available prevention strategies we have against COVID. 
I'll also try to touch upon uh, the Omicron variant. And also, I'm sure a lot of you are also hearing about the new variants that are coming, uh, that are being detected. So um, I'll try to stick to mainly the peer-reviewed uh, data that's available, which is usually the highest quality of information without depending on any um, rumors or any um, just um, random thoughts that people may be having. So. I thought we can first start with some good news. The past two years has been a lot of grim information. This data from the DC government website puts into perspective that it's it's probably heading, hopefully, in a good direction. Um, the number of uh, COVID-19 weekly cases reported in DC has been progressively getting better. And what's more important is that the number of uh, COVID-confirmed positive cases who were hospitalized uh, as of March 6 was zero. So the good news is that the number of cases did go down and the number of patients who've required to be hospitalized because of COVID has been going in the right direction uh, since the past two years. The first thing that I think we that the audience will need to understand is what are the different um, medical and biological terms that are being used so they can understand these uh, different prevention strategies, these different treatment modalities that are available. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to try and break down some complex uh, medical terms into more understandable terms so that it makes it easy for them to follow the news. It all comes down to how does our body protect against infection because what we all want to do is make sure that we are well protected, no matter if it's COVID or any other infection. So when it comes to our body, the body has a strong system, which we call as the immune system, which is the main uh, component, which is protecting our body against anything that's foreign to it. So whether it's a kidney that's foreign to you, or whether it's a virus that is foreign to your body, the body's immune system is the one that's going to protect us against this. So when it comes to the immune system itself, broadly we can classify it as two arms. One is the antibody response and the other is the cell mediated response. So whenever the body encounters a virus, these two arms are activated in our immune system and together these two have a complementary role with each other that protect our body from getting um, attacked or surmounted by the infection. So then it makes sense that the reason why we get multiple vaccine doses so that our protection against the infection is better. The vaccine is, is kind of like a mimic that will uh, tell us body uh, or mimic an infection in the body so that it tricks the body's immune system into responding as if there's an infection. So whenever there's a first exposure to the uh, antigen, there's a primary response where the antibody concentration in the blood will go up. Then when there's a second exposure to the antigen, there's a secondary response. And because of the memory that our body's immune system has, the response is much higher. So there's a much higher antibody concentration in the blood. So it's based on this rationale that the body's, uh, uh, the immune system has a memory and it will respond more uh, robustly each time that it's given a vaccine. This forms the reason why we have found that multiple doses of vaccine and boosters are essential in patients. This is even more important in immunocompromised patients, such as our transplant patients who take medications, because these medications such as tacrolimus and uh, uh, mycophenolate that you take lowers your body's immune system. So your body is already kind of uh, being told to be uh, less active whenever it encounters an infection. Hence, when we give you a vaccine, we need to give you uh, more doses than the general population so that your primary response and the second response that you have to the vaccine is comparable to the response that anyone who's not on these immunosuppressions will be uh, giving. When understanding the interactions with an infection and the human body, we have to understand that there are two uh, factors in play. One is how our body's immune response is responding. So how our host, the, the, the body system is working. And then the other thing is how the whatever is attacking the body is 
behaving. So there are two factors to be considered whenever we try to understand or predict how a certain infection is going to play out in the future. So in especially with COVID, there's been a lot of ongoing uh, talks about where different variants, mutations, where there, there's a new variant that's coming in. And these terms are being used very commonly in general, uh, in general public. So I thought this also needs to be clarified. So the virus variants are not common, are not unique to the SARS-CoV virus alone. A lot of viruses, bacteria do undergo mutations or changes that occur over time. And the reason this mutation occurs is because just like us humans, we are trying to survive uh, as best as possible. This virus is also trying to survive as best as possible. So whenever it is encountering a new uh, uh, antibody or a new uh, antiviral, it senses and tries to um, do undergo some mutations so that it can live much longer period of time. So these variants or changes that occurs in a virus can change these viral properties. So let's say if the virus spike proteins were previously green color, now these spike proteins because of a new mutation can now become a totally different protein shown here in blue color. So how does this interact with the human immune system is the big question because as I explained in the previous slide, our body's response to any infection is based on two arms, the antibody response and the cell mediated response. And these responses depend on what kind of virus the immune system is encountering. So let's say because of a mutation, this virus which was initially green is now becoming in blue color our body's immune system may not necessarily be able to recognize this as a virus and attack it in time. So it's because of these changes that a virus can undergo that it affects how a human body will respond to a new infection or a new variant. Consider this as, as your blood uh, with your blood vessels flowing and um, the, the antibodies in it. Shown on the left, let's say there's a virus that's entering the blood shown in blue and it encounters the uh, body's immune system. When this body's uh, immune cell interacts with the virus, it forms these antibodies, which are highly specialized in attacking only this particular blue colored virus. So this antibody will go on to attack this virus and is able to successfully destroy the infection. Now let's say because of a mutation, the virus is now not in blue color, but it's it's now changed its colors and it's now in green. When this virus now uh, enters the body and if the previously available antibodies tries to attack the virus, the previous antibody was only trained to attack the virus if it was blue in color. But because now the virus has changed the color into green, this antibody may not necessarily be as effective. And so the infection may persist. So without getting too complicated, the main salient points that we need to understand is the virus variants are not unnatural. It is, it's normal expected that the virus may undergo variation. What we need to be vigilant about is if each of these new variants, how will they affect our body's immune system? If the already uh, available immunity that we have mounted in these past two years, whether it's because of exposure to the infection or whether you developed immunity from vaccination, what is more important is that this immunity should be able to recognize and attack any more new variants that may be coming. So with so many um, uh, factors that are in play to determine how we can safely protect us, what variants are going to come is not in our hand. The immunity that we develop, it depends partly on our uh, on our environment and uh, the vaccination. So the really the factors that are really under our control to ensure that we stay protected is to make sure that we stay up to date with our vaccination make sure that we continue masking and make sure that we continue social distancing. Although the, there is now no more mandate to continue masking for the general population, it, it still is important as the immunocompromised community that we continue masking so that 
we prevent from getting ourselves uh, exposed to this virus. When, when you encounter, when the person in front of you is not wearing a mask, he is going to be um, shedding a lot of these droplets. But as long as you are wearing a good mask, a good N95 mask, which confers enough protection, the chances that you will inhale a virus, the chances that the virus will get into you is mitigated. And it's even more lesser if you're practicing appropriate social distancing and practicing avoiding uh, crowded uh, places or gathering in large numbers. Um, so in the next few slides, I want to go over a few data that's now available regarding the vaccination and uh, the other new uh, therapies that are available. The, uh, this data that came in 2021 looked at what is the efficacy of getting a third vaccine dose, especially in these immunocompromised uh, community that we are more worried about. So this study looked at 120 solid organ transplant recipients. So all of these were patients who are on immuno uh, suppressive medications and anti-rejection medications. This was a double blind randomized control trial. So whenever we interpret any uh, journal articles or data, we want to have the highest level of uh, accuracy of the uh, information that we are getting. So a double blind randomized control trial means that it is a very robust and uh, try a data that we can trust um, much more than the others. And what they looked at was they wanted to see whether uh, a third dose was more effective in, in destroying the uh, virus. So in this slide, if you look at the panel C, when you look at the red bars, you see that the, uh, the neutralization percentage or the percentage of how, of how robustly the virus was uh, destroyed before the third dose uh, was 40%, whereas after a third dose, it increased as high as 100% in those who got the third dose, whereas there was no change in those who got a placebo. So this study proves that uh, compared to two doses, the third dose of the vaccine in transplant recipients was significantly better in conferring better protection. And also in this study, we saw that the third vaccine was very well tolerated. Uh, there was no um, uh, um, concerns for any rejection in these transplant patients. And as we already saw in the uh, uh, poll that uh, Mr. Conway showed, a lot of uh, you have already received a third vaccine, which is, which is extremely commendable and a, a great job on, on your part. So now that the, the guidelines are changing, there's now a recommendation that all immunosuppressed patients receive a fourth dose of this vaccine. And so this data that came out very recently, just this month in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, what it looked at was to see whether the fourth dose of the mRNA vaccine was effective against the Omicron, which, which is the variant that we are currently looking at. And what it found was that the fourth dose of the vaccine was highly immunogenic, which means that it was very, uh, it was effective in making your body produce antibodies. The fourth dose was safe and efficacious. So if you look at the graph shown on the right, you will see that the, uh, the between the yellow colored and the brown colored panels, the top panel showing the uh, one kind of mRNA vaccine and the bottom panel, the data on the other mRNA vaccine that's available, you'll see that five months after the third dose, the, the vaccine was still uh, efficacious in neutralizing both the Delta variant and the Omicron variant. And then when the patients got the fourth dose, the response that was seen was much higher than after the third dose as shown in the brown panel in the subsequent uh, graphs. So what they concluded was that the maximal effect of mRNA vaccine was achieved after third dose and that the antibody level was restored by a fourth dose. So based on this, it is highly recommended that all our transplant patients and immunosuppressed patients be encouraged to get their fourth vaccine dose. When if the other 
important component that needs to be addressed is, is this vaccination effective in preventing symptomatic Omicron infection? Because what we really care about is whether we are falling sick because of this uh, COVID infection and whether we need to be hospitalized because of this. So this study that was done uh, in Qatar, also published just a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that compared to the to two doses, a third dose of vaccine was significantly effective in reducing the uh, uh, incidence of symptomatic Omicron infection. So shown in the graph, the red line uh, represents those who got two doses and the blue line shows those who got three doses. And you can see that the, the, the people who got two doses had more incidence of the symptomatic uh, Omicron infection than those who got three doses. So the booster effectiveness against the COVID-19 related hospitalization and death due to Omicron when compared to getting just two doses was as good as 76.5 percentage. Then I wanted to, I looked at the data to see whether where these new variants that are being reported in other parts of the world, whether the vaccination is going to be good enough in protecting us against those variants also. So this was again a very recent study that was published just this month. It was done in 24 subjects and uh, all of whom had received two doses and received an additional booster. So a total of three doses. The, the idea of the study was to see whether these uh, variants BA.1 and BA.2 were neutralized by this vaccination. And the good news is that there is a substantial degree of cross-reactive immunity between these two variants. By cross-reactive immunity, what I mean is that when we looked at the previous slides, with when the virus was previously blue in color, and then there's a new variant which is green in color, the antibody that was produced against the previous variant was still effective in responding against the newer variant. So this can be taken as a good news that the newer variant, if it becomes a, a, a significant variant of concern, then our vaccination, the immunity that we have developed as a result of vaccination should still be um, uh, reasonably good enough in protecting us against uh, this uh, Omicron variant. So the current guidelines uh, as they stay both by the CDC and the American Society of Transplantation, uh, the vaccination for the vaccination guidelines for the immunocompromised individuals, the primary series now consists of two, three doses. So the second dose to be given after three weeks of the first dose and the third dose to be given at least a month after the second dose. In addition to that, everyone should get a booster which should be given at least five months after a third dose. Now, if your primary vaccine, you received the J&J or Janssen vaccine, then after the first dose, a second dose of an mRNA vaccine is recommended to be given at least at four weeks after your first dose and get additional booster with either of the mRNA vaccine at least two months after the second dose. So this is the current guideline that is uh, being recommended by all of us for all our immunocompromised individuals. And, and based on the data and the information that you have seen so far that I've shown you so far, now this guideline makes more sense and I hope more of you will go and uh, contact your healthcare professionals to get an, uh, the, your fourth uh, dose. So overall, we know vaccination works and we know that for immunocompromised patients, they need additional doses of vaccine. Uh, whenever possible, a minimum of two doses of vaccine should occur prior to transplantation. So this is for all our um, CKD patients and dialysis patients who are tuning in today to make sure that you get your vaccine series before you undergo transplantation. Because once you undergo transplantation, the anti-rejection medications that we'll give you will reduce your body's immunity. So you'll not mount as good a response to the vaccine as you would uh, right now before transplantation. And for post-transplant patients, administer vaccine beginning as early as one to three months after transplantation if you've not already received it prior to transplant. And vaccinate patients who've recovered from COVID after the symptoms have developed and the period of isolation have ended. All our patients that we are seeing at GW, those who received 
already three doses and if they've still contracted COVID, we wait for them to um, either get all the symptoms to be resolved. And once they are back to feeling their normal, we I recommend them to go ahead and get their fourth dose. That's about vaccination. Now I would like to switch gears and move on to the newer therapeutics that are available for COVID prevention and treatment. And I'll mainly be talking about monoclonal antibodies and the antiviral medications that are available. Before delving too deep into the monoclonal antibodies, I would again like to give you a brief uh, information about what these monoclonal antibodies really are. The term monoclonal antibody is not new. It's not specific only for COVID. Um, the monoclonal antibody is used in different fields of medicine. It's used in transplantation. It's used in different autoimmune diseases. But what is more important is to know what is the specific function that the monoclonal antibody is designed to be. So if you look at the left panel A, whenever our body encounters an infection, the way our body uh, response is by producing different colored antibodies shown there in blue, red, uh, purple, and yellow. So these are antibodies that are naturally produced in our body as a result of infection. And these antibodies can attack different kinds of infections. Now, moving on to panel C, let's say there is a specific disease that we want to target or a specific infection that we want to target. What we can genetically do is that we expose a, a, a study subject to the particular infection or the particular virus, and we extract these immune cells from the study subject. Then these immune cells are then genetically engineered to produce what we call as genetically engineered human monoclonal antibodies. And shown here only in blue color. And the difference that you will see is that these monoclonal antibodies are very specific for the infection that they were produced for. So just as in the previous slides, as I showed you, when the virus variants uh, occur or when a virus undergoes mutation, the concern in the, in the scientific world and the medical world is that a monoclonal antibody that was uh, manufactured to attack a specific variant, whether subsequent variants are also going to be uh, affected by these monoclonal antibodies. So based on this genetic information that we have, we now have what is called the pre-exposure prophylaxis for COVID, uh, which most of you know by the name of UV sheet. Now, what does this pre-exposure prophylaxis mean? As the term suggests, pre-exposure means it's something that you get before you get exposed to COVID, before you've had an infection because of COVID. And it's prophylaxis because the idea is to prevent you from getting, getting sick with COVID. So this is an investigational long-acting monoclonal antibody. Uh, by long-acting, it means that it's expected to last uh, in our body up to 60 to 90 days. It's, uh, it's approved by the FDA as an emergency use authorization. So it has not gone through the rigorous uh, study that is done before the FDA approves, but it has been uh, studied well enough for the FDA to uh, deem that it is safe to be used and that it serves the purpose. And because COVID has been life-threatening for many of us, it makes sense to start using it in high-risk patients because the benefit of using it is much more than waiting for the uh, years of uh, study before it gets authorized to be used. The mechanism that it acts is it prevents the virus from interacting with the human cells so that it prevents the virus from entering into the body. As I said, it the long the lifespan of this antibody once it's given to us it lasts somewhere between 60 to 90 days the trial that studied this um, uh, antibody that's the proven trial reported that there were serious cardiac adverse side effects in the in the study patients that is they had um, incidence of myocardial infarction cardiac failure of or arrhythmia, which was higher in the antibody group than the placebo group. But the difference, as you can see, is in the antibody group, six out of a thousand developed this side effect, whereas in the placebo group, two out of thousand developed the side effect. So this uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, is now um, available under FDA's emergency use authorization for those who are at a higher risk for contracting COVID. 
when the new variant Omicron came about, what was found was that there was a decreased uh, neutralizing activity of this um, um, UV shield against Omicron. So the FDA had increased the dose that was previously suggested. So among the um, audience, whoever received the previous dose of 150 milligrams of the monoclonal antibody, I recommend that you reach out to your medical professional to ensure that you receive the correct dose. And if needed, you may need to get an additional, additional dose to make sure you have the appropriate dose uh, of the antibody. Wait for two weeks after vaccination for the receipt of uh, the UV shield uh, so that the, the vaccination has enough time to um, get into full effect in your body. The data on vaccination after the monoclonal antibody prophylaxis is extremely limited. But what is important is that this pre-exposure prophylaxis is not a substitute for vaccination, masking, or social distancing. So who should receive UV shield? Now the, the guidelines are more broad. Those who are moderate to severe immune compromise due to a medical condition, such as uh, patients who were who have HIV or who have uh, immuno autoimmune disease that, that reduce their body's immunity, or those who have received immunosuppressive medications or treatments, such as our transplant patients who are on anti-rejection medications, and may not be able to mount an immune response to the COVID-19 vaccination, or for whom vaccination with any available or approved authorized vaccine is not recommended due to a history of severe adverse reaction to the vaccine. So anyone who's immunocompromised, who uh, cannot tolerate vaccination, all these uh, people are candidates to receive this UV shield pre-exposure monoclonal antibody. So this, what we heard about the U shield is the prevention pre-exposure monoclonal antibody. The next slide, this talks about the post-exposure monoclonal antibody. So this is monoclonal antibody that is given after you've been exposed to COVID or you've developed COVID already. So currently the only uh, approved medication that works against the Omicron variant is the Sotrovimab, which is to be given within five days of symptom onset or a positive uh, PCR. And we've seen that there has been a significant improvement in reducing the risk of hospitalization or death in patients who receive this monoclonal antibody once they uh, turn positive for COVID. The Sotrovimab neutralized uh, uh, Omicron variant better than the other monoclonal antibodies. So if you, if people in the audience remember there are other antibodies such as Regeneron that was available, currently the Omicron Sotrovimab is the only um, antibody that works against it. And if you've received Sotrovimab, vaccination should be delayed for 90 days until uh, after this monoclonal antibody so that the vaccination can have its full effect. Now briefly also touching upon antiviral medications. These are obviously antiviral medications. So to be given after you've been uh, tested positive for COVID, Currently, remdesivir is the only drug that is now FDA approved for the treatment of COVID-19. And this can be used both in outpatient setting, that is patients who have tested positive for COVID but don't um, uh, necessarily need to be hospitalized because they are relatively uh, stable and asymptomatic. So in non-hospitalized patients, uh, the recommendation is to do a three-day course initiated within seven days of symptom onset. And it's also approved for the treatment of hospitalized patients, which we have been using for the past year or so since this drug became available. The only uh, caveat is that the drug is not approved for patients with lower kidney function. But based on observational data and my own personal experience, when I think that a patient will highly benefit from remdesivir, even if their kidney function is on the low um, threshold. We have used remdesivir uh, with careful monitoring uh, to make sure that they don't develop side effects uh, from this. So uh, remdesivir is currently the uh, one of the drugs available for the treatment of COVID. There's now the emergency use authorization for two other antiviral medication. One is Paxlovid, which contains uh, two, uh, two antiviral medications in it. 
the concern with Paxlovid, especially in patients who are taking medications such as tacrolimus and cyclosporin, is that there's a lot of drug interactions. So if you do take Paxlovid, your uh, medical professional has to keep track of your N tacrolimus level to make sure that the levels are not going too high during the treatment during the seven days that you're on this antiviral. And the other antiviral medication that's available is the molnupiravir. This was a, again a more recent study that was published uh, in March of this, this year to look at whether all these new uh, treatment strategies that we have available, is it good enough to protect us against the new variant BA2 that's coming up? This is an in vitro study, which means that this was uh, studied in a, in a petri dish it was not a human study but what they found was that the uh, available uh, antibodies that we have the regeneron the sotrovimab and uv shield it may still be effective in protecting us against the ba2 uh, variant if it becomes a, a, a big concern in the future the variant is also susceptible to the antiviral medications that we have the remdesivir paxlovid and molnupiravir so um this the this is a good study in the sense that it reduces the apprehension that we may have for the future. Of course, it's very difficult to predict how the future is going to be, but at least so far, the, 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 the science that we have so far um, show, is showing good signs that maybe we do have enough uh, arms uh, available to protect us if this variant does turn out to be something of a bigger concern. So the bottom line is, our understanding about COVID is still evolving. We are still learning. We still have a lot to learn. There's still a lot of things we don't know and, and we don't know how the future is going to be. But what we do know is so far, the strategies that we, we have, masking, social distancing, vaccination, and also the monoclonal antibodies and the antiviral medications that we have, have so far significantly helped in preventing uh, hospitalization and death from COVID compared to what we saw when the pandemic initially started. The vaccination has significantly helped protect patients from COVID. Pre-exposure monoclonal antibodies are available for patients who are at high risk for COVID complications and cannot be vaccinated. And like I've been telling again and again, masking, social distancing and vaccination are still our first line in protection. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanka, for a very informative presentation on continued concerns and emerging therapies for the prevention and the treatment of COVID-19. We will now take a few questions that individuals sent in uh, when they registered for the webinar. And many of these questions were probably addressed during your presentation, but it would be great to reiterate some of this information. So question number one, how protective are N95 masks for the immunosuppressed in a one-sided masking situation? And now that mask mandates have fallen, is wearing an N95 mask sufficient for protection? Um, so uh, an N95 mask is 95% effective in preventing droplets from entering our respiratory system. So because we know that COVID is mainly transmitted through the droplets, when you are wearing your mask, you prevent the inhalation of these droplets. When you couple masking along with social distancing and vaccination, it is still effective in preventing you from getting infected. Of course, it, it is more helpful when people that you encounter are also wearing masks, but um, I would say that uh, it's not that we don't have any hopes. Continue wearing an N95 mask, even if the other person is not wearing, as long as you maintain a good uh, distance between each other. Thank you for that. How far post-transplant should one be before they can go out, um, go out in a social situation without masking, considering uh, COVID numbers are decreasing now? Um, my short answer would be never, uh, because we don't know, like I said, I wish we knew exactly what the future is going to be and how the pandemic is going to evolve. But I've been telling all my uh, transplant patients that they continue wearing a mask. Um, if they are going out, especially 
if you're not able to have adequate uh, social distancing, continue wearing your mask uh, uh, as much as possible. Um, it, I know over two years, we've all developed this fatigue of constantly wearing a mask and living lives like this. But I think these are very easy and simple things to follow to protect us um, and the fruits to wearing a mask are much higher. So all my transplant patients, I would never tell them ever to not wear a mask, um, uh, especially if they are going out in public and they don't know if the person sitting next to you is, uh, is vaccinated or wearing a mask or not. Thank you for that answer. Um, can you explain the difference between immunosuppressed and immunocompromised? Uh, oftentimes we use the two terms interchangeably, but is there a difference? Um, in, in, in terms of the human itself being immunocompromised and immunosuppressed is about the same because it means that your body's immunity is lowered. It's more of a semantic in the sense immunosuppressed means you are taking something to suppress your immunity. So let's say um, uh, you're on these medications that reduce your immunity, but otherwise you're healthy. That means you're being, your immunity is being suppressed. Whereas patients who have uh, diseases such as uh, HIV, who have uh, um, uh, uh, immunodeficiency syndromes, patients who have uh, uncontrolled diabetes, older patients, just as a result of their disease and age, their immunity is compromised. So that's the difference between immunosuppressed and immunocompromised. Thank you, that, that helps clarify things. Uh, we have one question that came in from um, an individual who is concerned that the fact sheet they received about Evusheld said that it is not approved by the FDA. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so a lot of these uh, medications that are being used for COVID, except the remdesivir, the sotrovimab, the UV shield, uh, in fact, even uh, one of the mRNA vaccine, all of them are not yet FDA approved. The U Shield is being used under what we call as an emergency use authorization. But <clears throat> it the way the FDA gives this emergency use authorization is after making sure that it is safe to be used in, in people. So the concern that, uh, that the FDA is not approved it is not entirely true because the FDA has approved it for the emergency use authorization. Um, and on, on a lighter note, actually a lot of medications that we use, uh, in fact, even some of the medications that we use for um, at the time of transplant to reduce your immunity, such as thymoglobulin, is not FDA approved for induction. It's used more for treatment of rejection. So the drug is safe. We know the side effects, it works. Uh, once the FDA does its due diligence and does all uh, and gets all the required studies, then we'll get the FDA approval, just like the drug Remdesivir was FDA approved recently. So um, the, the, that, that's what it means when FDA, it's not approved by FDA, but it's being used under emergency use authorization. Great, thank you. We have another question. Um, this individual said they know that infusions exist to treat COVID and the immunocompromised, but their medical team told them the supply is very scarce. Is that true? So the supply has been scarce, but we know that there was recently um, the uh, news article that uh, came out, which said that the uh, company and the US um, uh, government have decided to increase the number of uh, these monoclonal antibodies to be purchased and make sure that they are more widely available for the individuals. Um, even uh, what we are seeing is now the UV shield is more easily available for our patient. So I think it's, um, it's a matter of ramping up the production of these monoclonal antibodies by the pharma companies and uh, distributing it to the uh, medical community so that we can distribute it. So. Um, just like what we saw, uh, there was a shortage for masks at the beginning of the pandemic, and now we know it's available for everyone. So hopefully in the next few days, these monoclonal antibodies will be more easily available. 
Thank you. That's good news. Uh, we have one final question for you. And this individual says they are a transplant patient of almost 17 years. After two vaccines and a booster, they got a light case of COVID. During a monoclonal antibody infusion, they felt pressure in their chest. Their blood pressure shot up, and so they discontinued the infusion. They're okay now, but they but have any other transplant patients had a strong reaction such as this to the antibody treatment? So personally, um, none of my patients have had any reaction, but I have heard um, my colleagues in other hospitals who've had these reactions, but it's not unheard of. We know that um, uh, whenever you introduce a monoclonal antibody into the body, it's one of the things that we always watch out for because there's a high likelihood that you'll develop what we call as an allergic reaction to the monoclonal antibody. So the reaction that you got, um, I wouldn't say is unheard of, um, uh, but given that you've not complete, I don't want you to feel that you don't have any protection against the COVID because um, seeing how things are progressing, if you did not get sick enough from the time you got the COVID, maybe your body has enough immunity to fight against the infection. And even otherwise, we now have remdesivir, which is a, the antiviral available as a outpatient therapy. So we still have a few tools available. And as long as um, you're continuing to stay safe, um, avoiding crowded places, hopefully you, you'll stay safe and healthy until this pandemic ends. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanka. We greatly appreciate you spending time with us once again and sharing this information and answering these questions for us. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Always a pleasure. If anyone listening has a question that we did not get to during today's webinar, please reach out to us at info at aakp.org and we will work to provide you a response. We hope you have found this webinar informational and I would like to close with a few additional resources that may be of interest to you. If you are not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and family members, as well as living kidney donors. You can become a free member online at aakp.org or by calling us on the phone. In order to receive all of the benefits of membership, please include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life. We also invite you to follow us on our blog and social media for all the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers. By visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. You can also order materials by phone. We are pleased to share that our 2022 events will take place virtually to ensure all can participate safely. Our Global Innovation Summit with George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences will take place in May. Our Policy Summit is scheduled for June 30th, and our National Patient Meeting will be September 21st through the 23rd. We encourage you to visit our on-demand webpage where you can find educational sessions from our previous events. We continue to keep our coronavirus resources page updated, and you can access this page from our aakp.org homepage. We'd again like to thank today's speaker, Dr. Shanka, for sharing important updates about emerging therapies and COVID prevention for the immunosuppressed. We hope you will continue to be informed and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>